First of all, I want to uh, introduce our next chairman in, in Dr. K Kathy Badarcher. Uh, she's a very, very no well-known historian, and she, we're very fortunate that she came to join us from Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, she's the Director of Graduate Studies and Lecturer of Philanthropic Studies at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. And uh, she's well known to Chris Ruddy and Allison Lee here and others. And I think she might consider this a second home. Please take over. It's quite a privilege to be here. I can't believe I made it in person. Chris and I started talking. I started working on a, a paper three years ago now. Um, and we talked on the phone March 8th or something, 2020, and a little bit has happened since then. So, um, so thank you for inviting me and allowing me to chair this great session. It's close to my heart on um, commerce and culture, since I'm here from the land of Eli Lilly and Company, who you've heard just a little bit about this morning um, as an important collaborator um, and producer and steward of the discovery that was um, initially made in Toronto. So um, I have the honor of introducing two great historians to you. Um, first is Professor Christopher Ruddy, who's a Michael Bliss student, who's been a public historian here in Toronto for quite a long time. His specialties include medical history, public health history, and biotechnology. He's responsible for a lot of the public history that you see around campus. He gave me a tour yesterday, um, including some material culture and exhibits just down the hall from us. So, um, and now a collaborator. So it's a great privilege. Um, he's gonna talk to us about It Works, Now What? Thank you very much, Kathy. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for all this. I mean, I've been involved since the beginning of putting this together and been kind of swimming in insulin uh, for the last while, um, doing all kinds of stuff. So I'm just going to go right into this. So the title of my talk is, uh, It Works, Now What? Insulin Development, Production, and Distribution at Connaught Laboratories, University of Toronto. So and this is a, a nice image of the, uh, one of the uh, pamphlets produced by Connaught early on when, the, um, when they were producing insulin. So I'm just going to go dive right into this. Uh, I'm not sure if you've all seen this. Uh, Allison and I, and along with Grant Maltman, the curator of Banting House, were hired as consultants on the Heritage Minute that came out almost a year ago now. And uh, it nicely sets the scene. Um, so I'm just going to play it here. Leonard Thompson, 13 years old, diabetes mellitus, 65 pounds. Starve the child to let them live. The treatment's as cruel as the disease. It's a death sentence. Dr. Banting, this could be it. He's the first to receive this trial. But will it save him? It's not pure enough. So we try again. And again. And again. Before the discovery of insulin, diabetes was a death sentence. Banting, Best, Collop, and McLeod's breakthrough has saved millions of lives. Leonard Thompson's was the first. Okay. So, now hopefully you've seen, seen some of that. Actually, it turned out to be a very good experience, but I just want to ask the question, it works, now what? <laughs> Essentially, to pick up the story from the end of, the, uh, of that minute, and basically start off with the next day, literally, <laughs> after the, uh, uh, that second test by Collip, of the Collip's extract. On January 24th, a day after Leonard Thompson received his, uh, the more purified version of the pancreatic extract, J.B. Collip um, paid a visit to Fred Banting and Charles Besk and said, uh, well, well, fellows, I've got it. How did you do it, Banting and Best asked. I have decided not to tell you. <laughs> Collip then announced that he was leaving. 
uh, the group, and there it threatened to take out his own patent on the extract. Simmering as he listened, Banting finally lost his temper and took a swing at Collip. Fortunately, Best stepped in to restrain Banting before the altercation turned violent. And the, uh, the little clips there are from the Gloria Not For All uh, movie, who we're going to see uh, at the dinner tonight. We have uh, R.H. Thompson, who played Banting. Um, I'll be there tonight. But it's, uh, there was an important moment there. This confrontation reflected a perfect storm of fatigue, frayed nerves, frustration, excitement, and paranoia that had been building among Banting, Collip, and J.G.R. McLeod, and to a lesser extent, Best, that threatened, to th that threatened and threatened the future of their, all their work. Uh, the next, on January 25th, encouraged by Thompson's successful treatments but concerned about the future of the, the new extracts development and production, Dr. J. G. Fitzgerald, director of U of T's Connaught Antitoxin Laboratories, facilitated a, a seminal agreement between Connaught and Banting, Best, and Collip, and, and McLeod. He offered them support from the Connaught Research Fund for about $5,000 at the time, and the last facilities and scientific staff in the medical building, uh, in the basement actually, downstairs from Banting and Best Labs. So it's critical that the medical building itself is a real character in this whole story, really. It gets a bit overlooked. We're talking about the people, but the building itself is, is very important. Um, and the agreement was to help develop methods to produce the extract to enable further clinical trials. So you can see a few highlights from the, uh, from the uh, first page of the agreement. And uh, first, one of the key things was for the, the team not to take out a patent with anybody, any commercial firm for at least a period of time. And then also, at the, the last item there is that uh, the event of the extract or extra, extra, extracts being uh, basically not work or of no commercial value uh, could not absorb any costs involved with that process. So not to worry. So Connaught Labs, and I wanted to give you a bit, bit of background about Connaught. So between 1913 and 14, Connaught Labs' origin was driven by the major public health threat of diphtheria and the lack of a Canadian supply of diphtheria antitoxin. Dr. John G. Fitzgerald, who lived from 1882 to 1940, uh, took the initiative of establishing a small stable and lab in the West Toronto backyard of Bar on Barton Avenue of William Billy Fenton uh, to prepare diphtheria antitoxin. So, and actually, it's the original backyard stable, and at the Sanofi, current Sanofi Canada, Pastor, Sanofi Pasteur site in Toronto, we have the original stable um, restored in a museum in there. So I can go on a, a lot about this stuff, but I don't have time in this context to go into this in too much detail. But I just want to say, Fitzgerald quickly secured the support of Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health, who committed the government to buy antitoxin at cost and would provide it at a much lower price than the imported product. On May 1st, 1914, sort of, uh, 108 years ago today, almost today, UFT's Board of Governors summoned, assumed responsibility for Fitzgerald's antitoxin laboratory, providing modest space in the medical building basement. The antitoxin lab would be self-supporting, any proceeds directed to improving facilities, research into product improvement, and funding a preventive medicine teaching for medical students and graduates' public health education in the Department of Hygiene. 1914-15, soon after the start of World War I, a severe shortage of tetanus antitoxin, driven by a deadly mix of wounded soldiers and trench warfare in the fields of Europe, prompted expansion of the antitoxin lab to meet Canadian and British military ex demands. In 1915, Colonel Albert E. Goodram, who was a distiller, ran Goodram and Warts, and if you know the distillery district downtown Toronto, that's his legacy. He was a member of the Ontario Red Cross and a member of the UFT Board of Governors. He facilitated the acquisition of an abandoned farm property and the building of, a new, of new facilities to accommodate the many horses and needed, that were needed to prepare the antitoxin. On October 25, 1917, the lab's expanded facilities officially opened and were named Connaught Antitoxin Laboratories and University Farm. They were named after the Duke of Connaught, who was Canada's Governor General uh, between 1911 and 1916, and the labs remained part of the U of T until 1972. And this is how things look today, actually, up there. Today, the site on Steeles Avenue West and Dufferin Street continues as a Sanofi Pasteur Canada Connaught campus, actually recently renamed Sanofi Vaccines Toronto. It's been a kind of a name change. Uh, but we can see the original building, the original stable. Uh, I, I work as a sort of resident historian there. I have an office in the, the bigger building um, and a heritage room we work on. Actually, I'll see, show that in a second here. The original building 
at the main entrance includes a heritage room in which the insulin story is told. So we have a number of exhibits there and some original artifacts, some of which uh, you might see on the back of your money, <laughs> and, and the stamp recently last year. So January 26, 1922, shortly after signing the Connaught Agreement, Collip wrote to the president of the University of Alberta. Today, $5,000 has been placed at our disposal to secure apparatus, for assistance, et cetera, to rush the work for the next four months in the hope that we may establish a block of, a block of clinical evidence which will provide or prove either the value or the worthlessness of the substance in treating diabetes in humans. Uh, in, February, in early February 1922, Collip was overseeing moving from the lab bench to the larger scale production of the extract at Connaught. Best was actually had been appointed as um, director of production for Connaught in the basement of the medical building. Kind of actually um, sort of a retroactive appointment as of January 1st, 1922. He was to also give uh, some funding support for his master's uh, research, which, which was related to insulin as, as well. On February 12th, Best wrote to his father, who was a physician in uh, Pem West Pembroke, Maine. We have a new, our new lab fairly well completed. We began work yesterday afternoon, but one of the stills blew up <laughs> at the first trial, so we are held up again temporarily. <laughs> Six other severe diabetic patients at Toronto General Hospital received the pancreatic extract during the late January and early February. However, the first resurrections were temporary and as an extract famine began to, in late February when attempts to increase production at cannot prove problematic. And, um, and Leonard, Leonard Thompson and the other initial patients cannot continue treatments. So actually to go back uh, off, of, off of insulin, it wasn't called insulin yet, but off the extract uh, for a while while they figured this out. Moving from lab to clinical trial scale and then to large scale production for, of the extract was a major challenge for Connaught Labs. Between March and May, after frustrating failures, production was, was finally restored under best full direction. So there's a nice little, like, I won't read this, but that's a, a, a piece out of the end report from Fitzgerald, uh, which nicely summarizes the, the work that was happening uh, up to that point. And Connaught then dedicated its full, though modest, resources to insulin production and output rose steadily. And as of May, early May, the term insulin extract was given the name insulin. And this is around the same time as we've talked about with McLeod giving his talk, we're giving the talk down in uh, Washington. Overcoming the insulin production challenges was the hardest for Collip at this particular time. Uh, in a letter uh, by Best to his father on May 10th, there's been a lot of trouble and quarrels, et cetera, but we are getting on. Collip has not played fair, at least at this point. He was, in, he was in charge of making the extract. Banting and I were going along with the clinical and physiological, respectively. He, Collip, was kicked out yesterday, and I'm in charge of making the dope. He was called the dope. It means a lot of work, long hours, et cetera, but I hope to get it standardized before July. So this was a kind of a key transition point. Um, and also Collip's time, uh, his, his year-long sabbatical was up, was up, or almost up, and so he was about to go uh, back home anyway. Best, place was bla Best was placed in full charge of all as aspects of the development, purification, and production of insulin at Connaught at, at this point. On May 30th, meanwhile, a unique one-year collaboration was arranged between the University of Toronto and Connaught and Eli Lilly of Indianapolis, designed to expedite the development and large, of large-scale insulin, insulin production methods. This and other agreements relating to insulin production, licensing, and patent protection were negotiated by the University of, Toronto, insulin, uh, University of Toronto's Insulin Committee, overseen by the University of Toronto Board of Governors. And Charles Best assumed leadership of Connaught's insulin production and worked closely with Eli Lilly, especially the company's research director, Dr. George Clues, pictured here. And uh, he, uh, Best and Call went down to Indianapolis a couple of times, and so there was important uh, work done initially there. The agreement granted Eli Lilly exclusive rights to supply insulin, or they called it Ilatin, in the U.S. to diabetic specialists for a clinical uh, evaluation until June 1923. It was a one-year um, agreement, specifically. By the summer of 1922, and before the work of, the, of Lilly commenced, key advances were made at Connaught that significantly accelerated insulin production. David A. Scott, hired by Fitzgerald for his chemistry and mineralogy experience, uh, developed a more efficient insulin extraction method based on acetone rather than on alcohol less expensive, and it was easier to work with. So David Scott is a key person in the story as well. 
as is Peter Maloney. A further critical uh, advance was made by Peter Maloney, who was Connaught's first uh, research chemist. Um, Maloney developed a method to more efficiently purify insulin based on the absorption and precipitation of proteins from an aqueous solution using certain minerals, including sodium benzoate. By the fall of 1922, Bologna's method made possible the production of 250,000 units of insulin with very satisfactory results, according to Best and Scott. So there are a number of key uh, articles by Best and Scott uh, through this early period um, uh, dis discussing the methods and how they evolved over time. So in June, the Lilly, uh, the Lilly team's first task was to repeat the small-scale insulin production experiments led by Collip and, and Best and also focus on scaling up with both lines of work going on in tandem. This process depended upon direct input from Collip and Best. Between June 2nd and 3rd, during that initial trip to Indianapolis, Collip and Best oversaw Lilly's first laboratory scale run of insulin. There were soon daily runs, but the greater challenge was large-scale production. And Collip and Best shared all they had learned at Connaught with Lilly's chemists. And as uh, Kathy mentioned, uh, we did a paper together, so you can look that up. It was recently published uh, last year. Uh, it turned out very nicely, I think. And I have a paper just, just got formally accepted today, actually, uh, which sort of develops this whole story here. On June 17th, Lilly's first large-scale lot of insulin was completed. On June 19th, Lilly sent his first insulin uh, shipment to Banting, totaling some 50 units. Best was brought back to Toronto with valuable practical advice how to solve a variety of Connaught's insulin production challenges. By mid-June, Collip would be back, on, back in Edmonton to resume his duties at the University of Alberta after his one-year sabbatical in Toronto ended. He would later produce insulin on a small scale in Edmonton to support further clinical evaluation. So there was a real effort um, from, the, from McLeod and the Toronto team to, to uh, allow small-scale uh, insulin production in different areas of the country, um, including Edmonton and also Santa Barbara and a few other places around as well. Well, insulin production improved. The limited supply, of, uh, ch supply challenges meant only a few critically ill patients, mostly children, would, could be treated. So you can also see on this slide this sort of like steadily growing uh, availability of supply to that 20, late 22 period. <clears throat> so by mid-May 1922, Banting established a private practice in Toronto where it could treat diabetic patients. The insulin supply, though, was very limited. Spreading news about the initial successful use of insulin sparked many desperate pleas to Banting from physicians on behalf of their diabetic patients, including from the US. McLeod's talk in Washington which, uh, stimulated a lot of this uh, interest particularly. One such desperate plea came from the physician of a 22-year-old boy, 22-year-old Jim Havens of Rochester, New York. On May 21st, Banting was able to send Connaught insulin to Rochester. Uh, Jim Havens was the first, US, first in the US to receive insulin. Uh, but not at that time, it was not quite potent enough, so there was a few challenges at first. On May 26, Banting himself went to Rochester to personally deliver more insulin, and regular shipments soon followed. In between June and July 1922, the rapidly growing attention to the Toronto insulin discovery brought desperate pleas from, from diabetics, their doctors, and families, few of whom could, Banting could help due to the limit supply. However, Banting was able to help three severe diabetic cases who came to Toronto from the US for insulin treatment, including Ruth Whitehall, who was an eight-year-old girl from uh, Baltimore, I believe. She was in Toronto from June 17th to, into September. Uh, Myra Blaustein, who was an 11-year-old girl, also from Baltimore, uh, was in Toronto from July to the end of September. And Teddy Ryder, who was a six-year-old boy, that's him on the bottom there. He was treated in July from July 8th into October. Between August 15th and November 30th, Banting's most famous diabetic patient was 15-year-old Elizabeth Hughes. With press attention to her, tightened by her being the daughter of the U.S. Secretary of State, Charles Evans Hughes. But it wasn't just because of that position that she got treated. Uh, she actually had a nurse, a private nurse, um, um, who was well-versed in treating. And so there was a real clinical opportunity to uh, learn a lot about, um, about her experience with insulin. And Elizabeth Hughes was sort of the model child, or model student. Um, at the time, and so there's a whole, I don't get into that here, but there's a, she wrote a whole series of letters home. I've done an article about that recently, um, going through the whole, that whole story. Um, so there's a lot to be learned. But just for one example, um, let me turn my glasses on. This, in October, this is a letter from October 17th. Um, 
and Banting, on October 17th, Banting took uh, Elizabeth out for a drive. By this point, she's doing very well, um, and you know, getting out and about, she's a young girl. And uh, this ex little extract from this particular letter, she says to her mother, we ended up by going to the Connaught Laboratory, which is in the basement of the medical building over at the university, and seeing extract made from the very beginning to the, to the last. It was the most interesting thing I've seen in a long time. They're putting out such large quantities now that it, that enormous plant is running night and day with the men working in relays. So, no perspective there. By August 1923, Canada's insulin supply found a firm foothold with a larger insulin production plant for Connaught, thanks to funds from the Ontario government and the lab's reserves. And the plant was established in the U of T's vacant YMCA building, which is actually where the current uh, Fitzgerald building is across the street in front of the engineering building, it was right there. Um, it, was a, uh, it was going to be torn down, but they were able to, to uh, convert it into an insulin plant. As insulin, pr insulin production steadily grew in Canada and the US, the University of Toronto Insulin Committee facilitated insulin patents and the licensing of production in other countries. Insulin Committee directly oversaw insulin quality control and licensing rights in North America. I have to remember at this time, too, there was no government regulation of any type. Uh, so, so the U of T basically was, played the role of regulator, tester, uh, so it was a whole, system, whole arrangement had been, had been built there. In Canada, Connaught held exclusive insulin production and distribution rights until about 1980. And Eli Lilly held sole U.S. rights in, until June 1923, when other, several other firms were able to supply the, were able to apply to the U of T Insulin Committee for licenses. By November, end of November 1923, Connaught was producing some 250,000 units of insulin weekly. The labs would also play a vital role in spearheading the global distribution of insulin, selling it at a low price or at no charge to individuals and physicians, drugstores, hospitals, clinics, or through a variety of, through various intermediaries, especially before larger firms were granted export licenses. So between 1923 and 24, the UFT Insulin Committee retained authority to approve export licenses for producers based in the US, the UK, Europe, and Australia, which would allow them to distribute insulin outside of their home country or des designated region. Connaught had no export restrictions. And so there's a nice summary there of, of when uh, Lilly or some of the other companies were able to export beyond a very uh, defined uh, space or defined region, which was very significant at that time. So Connaught's global vanguard role with insulin distribution is documented in a large ledger book kept in the Sanofi Pasteur Canada archives, which record every insulin order from January 2nd, 1924 through April 30th, 1927, some 10,000 orders. And there are two more volumes that, take, that carry up until 19, to July 1935, and that's just one page of them. So it's a, it's a big volume. Oh, that's a picture over there. So the release of the new insulin stamp last year uh, by Canada Post, which featured Connaught Labs Insulin Toronto vial, which I helped provide from the Sanofi archives, prompted the use of the insulin sales volume along with original filling records to trace the distribution of the, of the specific lot or batch number that is visible on the vial shown on the stamp, which is 292.19, uh, you can see it there. So tracing lot number 292.19 on the vial used on the insulin 100 stamp and cannot last filling record shows it was filled on July 24, 1924, along with 379 vials in packages of 5 by 10 cc units, uh, units per cc each. The 379 vials from that lot were distributed to some 100 different individuals, physicians, hospitals, and provincial boards of health, and to a doctor in Mexico. <laughs> Two packages were also sent had no charge to Dr. Herbert H. Best in West Pembroke, Maine, who I mentioned, was the father of Charles Best. Regular monthly shipments of 500 units uh, to Dr. Best continued at no charge for use in his rural practice at least until 1927. So you can see there's one of the, the uh, entries there. And here's a picture of Dr. Best. Tracing the distribution of lot, that particular lot led to a closer analysis of the sales volume ex entries focusing on the distribution of Connaught insulin outside of Canada during January to J July 1924, including two, 
the US, Ireland, Spain, France, England, New Zealand, Finland, Latvia, Greece, South Africa, Mexico, Japan, Hungary, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> all over the place. And actually, you can see I just highlighted a few examples. And most of the records are Canadian, not surprisingly, but then there's quite a lot of uh, different going all over the place. And there's a nice record there of each, uh, each uh, package and lot number and how much and how much it was spent and so forth. So it's quite a wealth of information. Uh, by early, in early 1924, Connaught filled several insulin orders from the US, including from a drug, a drug, store, drug stores in Niagara Falls in Boston, a physician in Omaha, and, and from Carl Votoglin, Vot, Vot, a professor of pharmacology at the US Public Health Service who was conducting research on the biological standardization of insulin. The most notable US customer of Connaught's insulin was Elizabeth Hughes who, after leaving Toronto at the end of November 1922, received regular shipments of varying sizes and at a declining price until at least the spring of 1927. She maintained her preference for Connaught's insulin, and there was little reason for, for her to change to U.S. produced type, although at some point she likely did. And this was an uncommon, once a diabetic goes on a particular type of insulin, they don't likely change unless there's a particular reason. And plus she started off with Connaught insulin, and at the time Lily's wasn't as, that great. <laughs> It was a, took a little, little time for that to kind of improve, and, but she was used to getting it. And there was a special arrangement through her father and um, his position that allowed that to happen. One of the first destinations outside of North America for Connaught's insulin was the Irish Free State, which in 1922 became a dominion of, of the British Commonwealth after a three-year war of independence. Challenges of obtaining insulin at an affordable price was a key problem, especially after the, the war. By December 1923, the Irish branch of the British Red Cross led an effort to start an insulin fund. The Irish Free State Government was unable to contribute to that fund at the time, and the UK insulin producers were unable to export because of the, uh, the nature of the uh, export license, and also the change from uh, with the Irish Free State now being a dominion, not uh, part of the UK directly, uh, they, they couldn't get, receive um, insulin from the UK. So appeal was made to Connaught for low-cost insulin. Connaught was well known to the British Red Cross due to the lab's extensive work during World War I, supplying tetanus antitoxin and smallpox vaccine to the British military. So you can see a little extract from a British medical journal, a little news item there that highlights um, appealing to Connaught and the impact on the price um, if it got insulin was, came from there. Connaught's insulin order book shows insulin shipments to several individual diabetics in the Irish Free State, as well as to shipments to a drugstore known as Phantom and Company, and, and company including, including one order sent to at no charge. The largest shipments from Connaught to the Irish Free State were to the Irish Red Cross Society in Dublin, totaling eight shipments of 20,000 units each between January 5th and June 2nd, 1924. So there's, I could go on and on about the other, a lot of other uh, shipments of insulin, the paper, as I mentioned, is, is, is accepted, goes into some of that detail. So there's a lot there to, uh, to digest. By 1926, insulin was patented and trademarked in 44 countries. Connaught's production methods 